So welcome back. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, literate programming with R Markdown. It is um, the last session of this workshop series. Um, and it's been almost a couple of months uh, since the previous session. So as just a little bit of a reminder, uh, of what we covered last time when we talked about data visualization with ggplot. Um, we created um, some line plots and some scatter plots and some bar plots using um, a package from uh, the tidyverse called ggplot2. Uh, and we also played around with uh, faceting in ggplot2 where you create basically well, two facets uh, in a plot based um, on some kind of level, usually of categorical variable. Uh, we didn't get too much time to talk about complex and customized plots um, because we ran out of time. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, but if there are any questions about that, and if there are any questions in general about what we've covered, seeing as it's been um, a while since we last spoke, um, if any of you have been you know, playing around with R and, um, you know, stumbled across anything that you didn't know how to solve, um, please do let me know. Um, I will actually pause the recording. All right, so if there are no questions, then uh, I'll talk a bit about what we'll do today, um, which is discuss literate programming with um, R, R Markdown. So basically, uh, we'll start off with discussing a bit about what literate programming is to begin with. We'll talk about um, why it is useful. And then we will uh, create an R Markdown document. So this .rmd um, that you see here is the extension used for uh, R Markdown documents. Uh, and this will contain R code, text, and plots. Um, we'll talk through the basic syntax of R Markdown. Uh, which actually I think most of you are familiar with. Um, and we'll also see how to customize um, this uh, code that we include in our Markdown documents to control its formatting. So what is literate programming? Um, when I say literate programming, I mean basically documents that allow us to combine nicely formatted narrative text along with code uh, and the code outputs all in the same document. So R Markdown is one example of such a document, um, but you may have also uh, heard of or worked with uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which do something quite similar. Uh, personally, I really like R Markdown documents um, because they are reproducible for one and uh, two, because they are very versatile. And I think that versatility is something that maybe puts R Markdown documents on a different level to Jupyter Notebooks, but. Anyway, I'm an R person, mostly Python people use Jupyter Notebooks, so I'm not gonna like <laughs> put Jupyter Notebooks down. Um, but this is how um, it works with an R Markdown document. Usually, uh, well not usually, always you have um, this .rmd file. This is basically the source file that is used to create an output document, which is over here. So this is quite similar to um, the view that you get, for example, on something like HackMD. So where it's like the black bit of HackMD um, is where you can make edits um, and maybe you do like the formatting that maybe makes it look a little bit uh, more complicated. Uh, and on the other side with the white background, you see the you know, outputted uh, file. So it's the same way kind of um, in R Markdown. You start with one file that you make edits and then you process that file and you get an output file. So here you can already see the various kind of like components of an R Markdown document. So first of all, over here um, we have well, it's called a YAML header. I'll talk about this in a second. But you can see that here I say that the title will be example. And here I can see that the title of my document is example. Um, and here I can see that there is some text, uh, which is very small over here. So maybe you can't read it, but it's the same text as over there. Um, and here I'm telling R to create a plot. Um, and this is the plot uh, that is created from that code. And it is part of my uh, document. So you can see how each part of, of the document over here relates to um, a part of the document over here. 
Okay, so I mentioned that one of the reasons I really like R Markdown is that it is very reproducible. So because it allows you to combine text code and the code output all in the same document, it makes it much easier to document your data cleaning and your data analysis, your data visualization, um, which helps both you and other people um, to understand your work. Um, so basically, as you're going you know, along and you're writing your code, um, it is quite easy to write next to that code, uh, write what the code does and why um, you wrote the code that way. Uh, by having the code and the explanation, the documentation right next to each other, it's just very easy to um, get back to an analysis. For example, if you've taken a break because you went on holiday or because you submitted um, this project for publication and you've you know, waited for a few months to get back the reviews um, and you don't exactly remember what it is that you did and why you did it that way, um, with our markdown documents, that um, documentation is easy to you know, look at while you're evaluating your code. Um, the other thing that I think is great is especially relevant when using R Markdown to actually create your manuscripts. So like the articles that you are trying to publish or uh, your thesis or something like that. Um, so basically when you have, you know, your, your paper, the, you know, text of your paper, um, the code for your analysis and the output all in the same place then it's very easy to avoid copy pasting errors because you don't have to copy paste anything. It's all already in the same document. Um, similarly, it's much easier to update your manuscript if you collect more data or change your data cleaning process uh, because you, again, don't have to, you know, like create 10 different uh, plots or something, and then go and remember which one the latest plot was or something like that to include it um, in your manuscript once you've done all your tinkering. Um, or yeah, if you need to, if you collect more data and all the numbers change, right? You don't have to go and take those numbers from where you did your analysis and update the results um, in your paper because those things all happen in the same place. So they're automatically updated when you run um, your analysis again. Um, and something else that I think is really handy is that because um, our markdown files are plain text files, they are compatible with version control systems such as Git. Um, so you may know that um, a lot of widely used version control systems like Git, GitHub, um, they don't do very well with binary files um, things like Word documents uh, don't really work very well when you're trying to uh, version control them with Git. But something like an RMD file um, is totally fine to use with Git and it will always like you know, be easy to read um, if you put it on GitHub or something like that. So if you're using uh, those tools using R uh, RMD files, it's really uh, handy. Uh, the other thing I mentioned was versatility, um, and I'm, I'll try to show this here. This is very simplified, um, you know, diagram, I guess, of how our markdown works. Uh, and I'm going to pretend that I understand exactly all the underlying processes that are happening. But basically, you start with the .rmd file, an R markdown file, and then you use uh, an R package called Knitter, and that package takes uh, your R markdown file and it creates some other files from it. One of them will be a markdown file, like what we see uh, when we type text usually uh, on GitHub or on HackMD, those are all markdown files. So it creates a markdown file for the text. And if you have any plots um, in, that, um, in that file, it will also create some figures. And then uh, there's another software called Pandoc that takes those files and combines them into uh, another output file. And you can choose what kind of output file you want it to be. By default, our markdown files will be net um, to or com um, compiled uh, to um, an HTML file. 
but it can also be a PDF file, a Word document, um, you know, a presentation, uh, all sorts of things. Pandoc is a really, really um, powerful, basically, converter of text from one form onto whatever other form you like. Um, so I wanted to mention this because, so I started writing all my papers during my PhD with LaTeX, uh, which is really nice for various things. But um, after a paper of mine got accepted and I'd been submitting PDFs to them because that's what LaTeX outputs, they were like, okay, yeah, that's great. Could you now give us a, a Word document? And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> I cannot because I can't turn a LaTeX document into a Word document. Um, I mean, you can with, Pandoc, but it doesn't work perfectly. Um, so I had to do so much manual labor, just like changing my perfectly good latte file into a Word document. And I was really annoyed. So with our markdown files, you can just knit to a Word document and it works, which is very, very handy um, if you submit to uh, journals that exclusively want Word documents. So end of rant. Um, I will continue now that um, yeah, the outputs that you can create um, from R Markdown are really variable. So it can be, you know, um, a report for your supervisor or your PI or something like that. You can create slides. Um, in fact, all of the slides that you've seen uh, throughout these workshops have been created with R Markdown. Uh, you can write journal papers and you can even create um, interactive web apps. So really, really uh, versatile what you can do with R Markdown documents. Um, okay, I already talked about the anatomy of our markdown documents a little bit, uh, but I can now talk about it with a little bit um, more detail, which is that um, this is um, a YAML header. Uh, I think YAML stands for yet another markup language, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but basically what the YAML header over here does is, well, to an extent, it provides some kind of like metadata for your document, right? Like the title and the author and the date. Um, but the most important thing it does is it helps you configure um, what your document is going to look like. So most importantly, it, um, you know, you decide what kind of output you want. So as I mentioned, this can be HTML or Word or PDF, etc. And we'll also see how you can easily um, yeah, make even more changes to, um, you know, um, alter the appearance of your documents uh, using that YAML header. Um, then over here, we have uh, markdown text. So this over here and this over here is just um, text formatted in markdown. And we'll talk about the basics of the syntax of markdown in a moment. And then we have code chunks. Uh, so these gray bits over here are um, the code chunks. Um, R Markdown supports quite a few different languages, obviously R, uh, but it also supports uh, Python, uh, it supports Stan in case you're doing any Bayesian, Bayesian analyses, uh, Bash, um, and all of that, so it's quite interoperable in that sense. Uh, and I think that is all uh, that I wanted to say from the slides. I will now... Um, go to our studio. So as we've done in the last few times, uh, to open our studio, uh, please navigate to the um, folder where you've saved uh, your R project uh, for this uh, workshop series and just double click on the uh, R project. Uh, okay, and I will close that from the previous session. Okay, so I will start by creating uh, an R Markdown document. So normally uh, to create uh, a new R script, we go over here to this plus thing um, or to file and new file. Um, so normally we select an R script. You, you're, you're still on the slides. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Um, yes, so I have opened uh, my R Studio, and yes, now I want to create uh, a new file. So yeah, you can either click on this little plus sign with the you know white rectangle or on file, a new file, and 
now we want to select R Markdown, not R script, R Markdown. And uh, it will ask me some information. So as a title, I will just um, say, uh, yeah, literate programming demo. Uh, and I'll leave the defaults as they are. So the output file will be an HTML file. And this is what um, R uh, creates. This is the template that we get uh, when we have uh, an R markdown file. So as you may have noticed, this is exactly the same as the example document I was using before. Um, so this is the R markdown file. And to get to that other file that I was showing you uh, before, the HTML file, file that I've outputted, um, if you see over here, um, you should be able to see a uh, knit um, command with this little like ball of yarn. Uh, so if you click on knit, it will ask you to save the file. Uh, demo, and I will make sure to save it uh, in my scripts. All right, and once I've saved it, um, like my terminal uh, over here starts, uh, not terminal, uh, yeah, the render thing here starts outputting various things while it's processing the file that it's rendering. And then eventually it will output um, an HTML file that looks like this. Cool. Um, so let's you know dive into this document um, and see what um, we can change. So over here, um, I have um, the YAML header that I mentioned before. Uh, it has a sensible title that I gave it. Uh, it auto-completed my name because it knows uh, my settings when it opened that uh, file, the date of today, and by default. Um, the uh, HTML document as an output. Um, if I wanted to instead uh, have a Word document, I would just uh, change this here to be Word uh, underscore document instead of HTML underscore document. And if I then again knit it uh, by pressing this button over here, it will again go to this render tab uh, and start doing things. And eventually my Word um, software will open up um, and it outputs the same document, unsurprisingly, but now uh, in a Word format. Um, but I will stick to HTML for now uh, because it's just a bit easier. Um, and I will show you how to knit to PDF documents uh, a bit later as well. Knitting to PDF is a little bit more complicated because you need to have something installed on your computer that lets you knit to PDF. Obviously with Word as well, if you don't have Word installed on your computer, you won't be able to create uh, a Word document. You need to have uh, Word installed for that to work. Okay, so this is how you go from you know the source uh, R Markdown file to a an output document, whatever you decided it would be. Um, and now I also wanted to show you how by editing the YAML header, you can make um, fairly big changes to your um, files uh, quite easily. So YAML headers are a little bit finicky because uh, they're one of the few things in R uh, that care about indentation, which is why I just like kept the template as it was because um, I don't want to do it from scratch because sometimes I make mistakes. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my cursor uh, just before the H of HTML document and I'm going to create a new line. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, well, when I tested this two hours ago, um, it created an indentation. This time it didn't, I don't know why. But anyway, you need to have um, to press tab basically um, once you have put the HTML document uh, in a new line. Uh, and 
now also put a colon after the HTML document. Okay, and now when I press return, it does create an indentation for a uh, second line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a table of contents just by writing TOC colon true. So if I now knit this document again, you see that it has created um, a little table of contents over here. I mean, it's not the prettiest one, but it works and it has links. So if you click on like the various headers, uh, it takes you to the relevant uh, location in the um, document, which is very handy. And as you saw, very easy to uh, create. Um, also, I mean, this document is fine, but it's not the prettiest. Um, you can also apply, um, you know, ready-made themes um, that you think look good. Um, one of the themes that I like um, is flatly. So again, like before, I created a new line that's indented um, twice from the start of the line. Uh, the word theme, colon, and then flatly. And if I knit this again, um, you can see that this has changed the font. Um, it's picked some different uh, colors and stuff like that. And I just think it looks a little bit nicer than uh, the default theme that our markdown was using. So that's just um, a couple of things about the YAML headers. Um, are there any questions? Did all of that work for you? You can give me the uh, thumbs up or uh, the yes green tick uh, in the reactions. Uh, all right, cool. If you have any questions, you can just write them in the chat. All right. So that was it about uh, the YAML header. I will now talk a little bit about um, markdown syntax. And I'm just going to take this all away and we'll write our own stuff in a moment. Um, I will be knitting things quite a lot uh, today, uh, just to show you how things change um, after you've made some edits. Um, you don't have to knit everything yourselves as well, just because sometimes um, it takes a bit longer. You can if you want to, or you can just uh, see how these things change uh, when I need things on uh, my computer. Okay, so let's write some text in Markdown. So if you want to write text in Markdown, you literally just write some text and it will just appear like this, right? That's quite straightforward. Uh, obviously, most of the times you want to give some more structure uh, to your text. Um, you will normally want to start with some kind of uh, header, which uh, in Markdown you create by adding uh, this pound sign and then a, a space and then the text uh, of your um, header or title. And in Markdown, you can have um, up to six levels of um, kind of like depth uh, of, sorry, I'm bad at talking and writing at the same time, uh, levels of headers. Uh, so I will just write all of these, um, and then I will knit and you can see kind of like the differences. Six. Okay. Um, right. So this is also handy to know. You can see that the table of contents um, only picks up uh, the first three levels of header. Uh, so anything up to this uh, level will also be included in your table of contents. Um, 
and anything on these levels uh, will not be. But you can see that R still understands that, you know, this is of like lesser importance, so it's becoming smaller and smaller. Obviously, something on this level is kind of not, it's a bit too deep in the hierarchy, and it's starting to look a bit funny because the normal text is actually bigger than the header, which is not really something that you want. Um, but in any case, these are the things that, um, you know, R Markdown allows you to create in terms of uh, headings. Um, something that I've actually not shown you until now is that R Studio also helps you um, keep track of the structure of your documents. If you look at this corner over here um, of the editor, um, you can see that it says outline. So if you click on this, um, it will show you um, this over here where it helps you, uh, it lets you, you know, navigate through your documents. So um, this is really, really nice for fairly long files uh, where you have, so this doesn't have to be in an R Markdown document, you can have this in an R document uh, as well. So if you have a pretty long uh, script, um, if you add titles and stuff to your, or sections in your file, you can use this basically table of content, contents to navigate um, your analysis files, which is really convenient. All right, so that is how you create headers. Um, I will now show you, so we could say, um, that our title is our markdown intro, and this is about headers. And this is going to be about text formatting. Okay, so this is how you write uh, unformatted text in markdown. Um, if you want to write some um, italic text, this is text, you can write it like so, or like so. So if I knit this, those things will look um, exactly the same. These are just two options that you have if you want to put something in italics. Um, And if you want to bold things, you can use two of those asterisks instead of one or um, two of the um, underscores instead of one. Uh, and again, if I knit this, uh, this is the same. Um, you can also combine italics uh, and bold. This is, um, bold italics, text, uh, you can also combine uh, these well. So you can also do all high, all uh, underscores and, you know, it will, oh, huh? That actually was just italics. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I will take that out in case that is not actually true. Um, <laughs> apologies about that. Um, you can also create some uh, strike through um, text. Strike through text uh, with the two um, tildes uh, one after the other. And as we can see, um, these all appear uh, on the same line. Um, even though over here, they are on different lines. Um, basically in Markdown, whether you use, um, a, you know, a, 
and enter, like if you create a new line or if you just um, add a space, um, that's the same thing. Uh, it just all gets put on the same line with the space in between. If you want to create actually a new line um, between two lines of text, uh, you need to have an empty line between them uh, like this. So if I knit this now, then these will go onto different um, lines like this. Um, something else uh, that you often want to do is uh, create lists. You can have uh, ordered lists or unordered lists. Uh, so starting with ordered lists, um, it's how you would expect it uh, to go. So if you want an ordered list, you would write something like this. That's one. Um, so for a list, you want um, a number at the beginning followed by um, a full stop, a space, and then uh, the text for uh, each of the items. Uh, notice that you again need to have space uh, between these. So where you say, you know, this is now going to be a list, colon, uh, and the items of the list. So if I run this now, um, you'll see that these all appear on the same line. But if I add the space uh, between the colon and the first uh, list item, then I actually do get a list like this. Um, our markdown does something that I think is quite helpful, which is that it understands that you want, you know, like a numbered list. Um, and you don't actually need to provide the numbers yourself. So this could all be one, if you're lazy and you don't want to do one, two, three, four, um, and the output will still be one, two, three, four over here, even though the actual numbers that you wrote are ones um, all the way down. So this is quite handy, yeah, if you're being lazy or, you know, if you keep, you know, reordering, your list or um, adding uh, items and taking items out. Uh, you don't have to manually go and change uh, the numbers every time. Our markdown will do that for you. And the same goes for if you want an ordered list with like A, B, I think, I think this works. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's interesting because I tried it with <laughs> a sub section and that worked. Okay, let me try this again. So, um, okay, you have each of your items and you may want to have, you know, some sub items uh, under one of these. So you can do that again with um, adding two uh, tabs here um, and then writing uh, your second, um, your first like sub item. And you can use letters, but maybe they need to be small letters. There's a lot of, you know, kind of like fidgety stuff here that yeah, so with small letters, uh, it works, but I guess, yeah, it needs to be a small letter and not a capital letter for it to work. So this is how you would do uh, this if you wanted. I guess this should be two and three. Um, and with unordered lists, uh, one, list. um, you can use uh, dashes, 
or you can also use um, asterisks uh, to create unordered lists. I know this isn't exactly fascinating, but it is helpful to know how to format text <laughs> in all of these. Um, so I will show you three more things on um, markdown syntax, um, which are how to add links. So if you want to add a, a link, uh, you can do so like this. So this is where he would write uh, a description of what the link is or the text that you want people to click, yeah, text to click, click. And this is where you would put the URL. Um, and quite similarly to this, Um, if you want to embed, embed images, you would do so um, by writing old text here um, and the URL to an image over here. Um, so, for example, uh, I have some, no, not this. This either. Right, so there is an R Markdown cheat sheet uh, created by um, Posit, the company that makes R Studio. So if I wanted to link to this uh, blog post here about how to use Markdown, uh, I could do that by saying, okay, this is an R Markdown cheat sheet. And this is the URL to that markdown cheat sheet. Uh, I don't know if this will let me net because this isn't valid. Okay, well, that works. Okay, and this is how that works. So if I click that, it's a link. Uh, it will take me to um, that markdown cheat sheet. Uh, and if I wanted to embed an image, uh, so yeah, you write an exclamation mark. And then you write some square brackets. Um, these can be empty, but I highly encourage you to add some alt text uh, here. Uh, and then you write the URL to um, the image that you want to embed. So for example, if I wanted to embed uh, this uh, logo for R Markdown, uh, all I would need to do is copy this uh, URL here make sure if you're trying to embed an image that you actually have the URL to the image. So it should end in something like, you know, JPEG or PNG or something like that. So if I copy that and put it in the URL here and say, uh, I net it then here it will um, embed that image that I asked it to embed. Note that if for whatever reason uh, it couldn't show this uh, image, uh, it would instead display the old text that I provided. So, you know, if there are internet problems or, you know, the link breaks or something, um, having that alt text means that people will at least know what was, was supposed to be displayed here. And obviously for people using screen readers, alt text is, um, alternative text is really helpful for them to be able to, you know, use the internet. <laughs> so it's always good practice to um, add alternative text uh, when you're using images, uh, et cetera, in your um, writing. Uh, and one final thing before I stop talking about Markdown syntax is how to add footnotes, um, which I think is quite handy. So to add a footnote, you write some text where you want the footnote to appear, and then you use this kind of like carrot thing, and in square brackets, write the text of your uh, footnote. This is the text of my footnote. And if I need this, um, we can see that this 
creates like the little, um, you know, sign that there is, you know, a note about this. And if you click on it, um, it will take you to the text of the footnote. Uh, and I did quite a bit of talking. Um, so is all of that clear? <laughs> Are you still awake? I'm sorry, I know that's not exactly exciting stuff, uh, but it's helpful for uh, knowing how to write, um, yeah, our markdown documents. Yeah, are there any questions? No, that's really helpful. Um, the only thing, so I know we were talking about writing lines, I assume you said you have to create a new line, but I assume if it's like a paragraph, it would just do its own lines anyway. Uh, yeah. Um, so if, sorry, could you explain what you... So you said to have a line space to add a space in the uh, markdown, but obviously if you're writing a big bit of text, that will have lines anyway. Yeah, so I mean, you could just write a, you know, a paragraph like this, which is how you would normally, oops, which is how you would normally write it, um, you know, in Word, uh, and it will look like a normal uh, paragraph when you um, um, knit it, uh, but it will also look exactly the same if you just do, the, oh, sorry, if you just do this a bunch of times. Um, so basically it treats um, texts that are on different lines, uh, but have no blank lines between them, the same as if there was just a space between them. So I actually quite like writing text like this because, and this is, bear with me for a moment, but if you're using Git <laughs> to version control your documents, writing text like this is actually really handy because um, it's much easier to compare um, versions because basically Git will show you things line by line um, like this. So if you have a piece of text that is like this and you make one edit over here, say you remove the sum, um, when you compare the ver this version of the text with the previous version of the text, all of this would be highlighted as having been changed. But if I did the same over here and removed the sum, then only this line would appear as having been changed, um, which is handy if you're just trying to have a look at you know, the changes that have been made in the document. But anyway, this is a little bit you know, unrelated. It's more about like if you're using version control at the same time. Um, but yeah, hopefully that still answered your question. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So it is kind of like we're close to the hour. So if you want, we can actually take a break, which we've never done before in this series of workshops, uh, or we can uh, keep going. It's entirely up to you. Today is a little bit of a lighter um, program anyway, so we can take a break. <laughs> um, can I have a thumbs up, thumbs down? Thumbs up if you want to take a break, thumbs down if you want to continue. Okay, I see votes for a break. So let's reconvene uh, at four o'clock. All right. Cool. Uh, so now it's, I think, about time that I showed you how to use um, code chunks in um, our studio in uh, our markdown as well. So, um, could, what I showed... could you oh, yeah. make your screen full? Um, it's just a bit easier. Figure right? Yeah, let me see. I think Oop. like this. Uh, the whole just the R. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, I see. Nice. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, yes, to create code chunks in R, so those looked kind of like uh, those gray boxes um, in the example that I showed you before. Um, you can 
add them fairly easily by clicking on this um, button over here. This it's kind of like a green button with the uh, letter C for code. So if you click on that, um, it will give you options about what kind of uh, language you want that code chunk to be in. Uh, by default, it will be R, but as you can see, you can also add uh, Python or SQL or Stan or Bash or whatever, but we'll only talk about R today. So when a code chunk is added uh, and it has been done properly, um, you will see these little um, signs over here. Basically, what creates the chunk is uh, these three backticks um, and then curly brackets with um, a letter showing the language that you'll be using or a word showing the language you'll be using and then closing the curly parentheses, uh, the curly brackets and uh, finishing off with three backticks again. So you can also create that by yourself if you want to for some reason to do that. Um, like so, and then you just create back text. So you may, if you've seen um, the places where I've added R code uh, in the hack and D's, you'll see that it looks exactly the same uh, like this. Um, or the way that I usually uh, add code chunks is by using this um, abbreviation or this shortcut over here. Oh, it finally showed up. Okay which is, um, yeah, in, in, in a Mac option, uh, command and I, um, in um, a Windows computer, I guess it's alt, uh, control and I. So that's how I usually add code chunks because it's fast and it will by default add an R chunk. Okay, so, um, Let's just write some code. So for example, the going back to the things that we've been doing the last few weeks. So let's create a vector called countries. Um, and previously the countries I've added here uh, were um, the UK, or I think I usually just write UK. Um, Greece and Netherlands. So if I run this uh, like normal, uh, as we do with an R script by clicking um, control and enter or uh, command return, um, that will just run this code and um, you know the country's vector will appear in our, in our environment. Um, and if I then wanted to um, also add something like the population of those countries in millions. Uh, I think it's 68, 11, and 17. So I could do the same thing again, where I just leave my cursor on the line and uh, click Command uh, Return. Or um, if you see over here, I could click on this button uh, with like kind of play um, symbol on it, the triangle that says run current chunk. So if I run this, it runs um, all of the code in my current chunk. Uh, the button next to it, if I run it now, it won't do very much, uh, but basically it does what, as it says here, uh, it runs all the chunks above. Currently there aren't really any chunks above, so uh, this won't really do anything. Um, but this is really helpful um, when you have a long script, um, you can just click this button and it will run all the code uh, above the chunk, the chunk that you're on. Uh, so this is how you create uh, code chunks in R. Um, and something that I'd like to show you when you're working with actual data is um, normally I separate the various code chunks based on, you know, an, a coherent output. Uh, so I would often have, uh, you know, a code chunk that, um, will load my packages. 
And in R, you can in our markdown, you can actually name your uh, chunks. So you do that by going next to the letter R for you know saying that you want to be using R in this chunk. You uh, add a space and then you write a name. So I would here write something like load packages. Um, those names should be unique. If um, two chunks have the same name, R will not um, compile your document. It will throw an error. Um, it's also quite specific about you know, how it wants words to be separated. By default, just use uh, hyphens like here and you'll be okay. And you know, it's usually better to keep them fairly brief, but you know, that to an extent is also just like personal preference. So here I would, um, you know, write all my library um, commands. So library tidy verse, which is something that I need uh, to then be able to uh, read some data. Read data. Okay, so the way that we read in our data um, was by writing read TSV, oops, um, and then the path of where those files are saved. Uh, in this case, data clean, and then COVID data clean dot TSV. Okay. Um, so when I run this, uh, I get an error um, saying uh, it could not find the function read underscore TSV, um, which is because I did not run this command. Um, so yeah, here I could now run this thing and you'll see that it kind of shows um, kind of like a loading bar next to the code when it's running it. And uh, we see the output of uh, this command over here that yes, it has loaded um, the tidyverse. Uh, and now, now that I run this, this Given what we know, this should have worked, um, but this is still not working. It's telling us that this path does not exist in the current working directory. And then it tells me what the current working directory is. So the current working directory, according to this, is not our intro, um, like it has been all this time, but it is now our intro and then scripts. This is because um, our Markdown files uh, have this feature that they set the working directory to be where they are saved. As you may remember, part of the reason we created this R project file is to set the working directory to be where the R project is saved. But with yeah, the presence of an R markdown file basically supersedes that, and the working directory is by default set to be in the scripts folder. So there are various things that we could do. Um, we could take that into account and say, OK, I know that we are in scripts, and for this to work, we actually need to go a folder up, and we need to go out of scripts and into our intro. Um, Okay, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot how to go up um, a folder. Uh, it's with uh, two full stops instead of one. So that basically said, go a folder up from where I am, and then from there, go into data clean and into here. Um, I don't like this very much. I find it uh, annoying. So the way that I usually work with relative paths when I'm working with an R markdown file, and honestly, any file at this point, is by using this package called here. 
So go ahead and install this package. Uh, so install dot packages, open and close parentheses, and in um, quotes, write the word here. And just run the command and it shouldn't take too long to um, work. Uh, so once you see this message, uh, it'll be okay. Uh, so I will now put this package uh, over here as well so that it is um, loaded. Um, and it tells me here starts at um, our intro like before. So yeah, here is basically another package that looks for various files and uses them to set um, the working directory. And here we'll look for the R project file and it will use that um, to you know, set the working directory. Um, so, okay. To, so you could be like, okay, so the working directory is now here. So if I do this, will it work? Well, yes, it works because of this. Um, this still doesn't work because uh, here uh, starts uh, at the location where it told us, uh, but we are not using here in this command yet. So basically to use here, what you need to do is use that to create the file path. Um, so literally by just saying the word here, um, and then writing the, um, the file path from uh, the working directory that here has set. So this has now worked. Um, so all you need to do is just basically enclose this path into here and parentheses, and then it will over you know, override this behavior of our markdown of setting the working directory into, um, you know, the folder where the R markdown file is saved and it will use the working directory that here wants to use. Um, something that I think is quite handy is that um, with here, you can also not actually give um, a full path with, you know, the, um, uh, Jesus, sorry. Um, okay, well, my brain is blank, but this thing <laughs> to separate the folders. Um, but you can just use commas to separate the names of the folders and the files uh, in the path, and that will still work. Um, that can be helpful considering that, um, you know, different operating systems use different, you know, like left leaning or right leaning or um, whatever to separate um, the file paths. And you know, if you can't remember which one is the right way, you can just use the commas that here allows and um, your path will work and you don't have to worry about you know, that interoperability between, um, between operating systems though. R kind of doesn't care what the Windows operating system uses and it just sticks with the this, I'm sorry, I really should remember what this is called. If someone remembers what this is called, please write it in the chat because it's going to bug me. Um, but yeah, um, does, does this make sense how to use here? Uh, basically, yeah, you just write the, the word here and put the path into um, parentheses. But if there are any questions, um, you can write them in the chat or Give me a thumbs down or next. Okay, that looks good. Great. Okay, so now that we finally read in our data, um, we can. Um, yes, I wanted to show you uh, how to create a table. So I'm just going to add a new. Um, chunk. Okay, so we have our COVID data. Um, and what I'm going to do is I am going to um, 
we have uh, NAs here, so I'm just going to go ahead and drop those uh, just to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, and then I'm going to filter for um, Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to filter for countries um, within this data set that are part of um, those uh, countries in the vector that I created. I'm sorry, my typing is quite sloppy today. Uh, and I'm only going to keep observations from uh, the year 2020. Uh, and I'm going to calculate uh, how many total deaths there were in each of these countries for the year 2020. Um, mutate deaths per year equals some uh, death. So this is all stuff that we talked about uh, in the data wrangling uh, session. So I'm um, yeah, doing some filtering um, and this, um, in case you don't remember this funky symbol, uh, keeps only the countries in my data that belong in that vector. So only UK, Greece, and the Netherlands. And I think UK may not work because I think it's called United Kingdom in that data set. So I'll just run that again. And then only for the year 2020, and I will create a new um, column that just sums up all the deaths um, that happened in each of those countries for the year 2020. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and actually I should do this uh, with summarize because this is not going to do it for each country. Um, summarize. Okay, does this work? Yes, but only for two countries. Aha. United Kingdom, not United Kingdom. Okay, cool. Um, so, don't worry about um, this just now. What I want to show you here is how you could display this if you wanted to um, as a paper, um, as a table in a paper that looks nice. So I actually think that the output here does look quite nice, but if I knit this document, um, Um, this is the table that has been created, which admittedly um, is not, it, it looks a bit rough, right? It looks like output from um, an analysis. It doesn't look like a nicely formatted table that you could include um, in a paper that you were writing. Um, but there is quite an easy way to do that or you know, um, a fast way to do that. Uh, so there is a command from the knitter um, package, which is the package that we're using to you know, knit our documents, etc., called uh, cable. Uh, so by adding this, um, if I knit it now, um, okay, this is how it outputs um, here, but if I knit it, um, this is how it looks um, in the output, which does look a lot uh, neater than before. Um, so it's quite straightforward. It's just by adding one line. Um, if, you were, if you're wondering about what this syntax means over here, um, what it means is look in the knitter package and find the function cable. Um, it's a way of um, using uh, functions from a package without having to uh, load the package, or um, if there are two um, functions, um, if you have packages 
loaded that each have a function with the same name, but that do different things. Um, you can still use both of them, but you just have to say which package they came from, and this is how you would do it. So this is a simple way to um, create some, you know, more nicer looking uh, tables. Of course, this is still not perfect. Did I close the thing? No. Um, so it looks nicer than before, but it's still not quite great. I mean, normally you would capitalize the names of the variables and you wouldn't have underscores between the, between the words, but you can use this function to also edit those things. So within this table function, you can say, um, Call dot names, and then say concatenate. Um, so the first one I want it to be country with capital C, and the second one I want it to be uh, deaths per year without the underscores. And um, this uh, changes it. There are different things that you can do with this. Um, you know, you can uh, highlight uh, the various rows or you can add caption. Um, so you could say caption equals um, deaths per country for selected contributors. You say COVID deaths. Um, and there are also, um, so this has added this here, and there are also packages to um, help you basically format um, the look of your tables in Markdown, but there are some inbuilt functions that um, for simple uh, scenarios uh, take you a fairly long way as well. Um, something else that is really nice and I mentioned in, um, the reproducibility reasons for using um, our markdown was that you don't have to copy paste things, right? Because they're already in the same uh, place altogether. So I wanted to show you a bit about how that would work. Um, I'm just gonna copy that. And take away. So if I save um, you know, the output of this code in a variable, I can then also call um, you know, this output in my uh, text. So if, for example, I wanted to say there were you know, X COVID deaths in Greece and 2020. Uh, I mean, there are various things I could do, right? I mean, I could just go look at this and see, okay, there were 4,682 deaths in Greece and go here and write 4,682. Of course, this is, um, you know, fallible. <laughs> uh, I could make a typo or uh, a rounding error, or, you know, um, I could just neglect to change this number after I've made some, you know, changes in the underlying um, data cleaning process or something like that. A nicer way to do this is to call the actual number from here into here. So I could say, um, so deaths per year, um, and I want the um, deaths per year um, variable and Greece was a first. So work. yeah, so you can see that this is some actual code that I've written in R, right? So what this says is go to the deaths per year uh, data set, look at the deaths per year um, 
variable and look at the first one, which is Greece, uh, and return the value, right? So if I run this here, um, it will return 4,682. Um, and by writing this in my text, it does the same thing. So basically, by using these single backticks, I'm telling um, R that I'm now going to write some inline code. Um, and then I specify which language I want to write in, and I write the code that I want, uh, and it outputs the, the actual number that um, I want to show. I mean, this is still not perfect because, you know, if I changed what the country's vector was and there were more countries in there, then maybe the first country wouldn't be Greece. So it would be better to actually, you know, signal somehow that it's Greece specifically by name um, that I want referenced here. But, you know, this already gets us um, some of the way for, um, you know, reproducibility and avoiding uh, copy paste errors. So that's one thing that I think is really nice. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to show you was um, displaying plots um, in our markdown. So I'm going to copy um, the same code mostly uh, and create a fairly simple plot, I hope. Um, Okay, so um, please do write in the chat if any of this is unclear or confusing or if you're a bit lost um, and I'll try to help. So now I'm going to take this data set. Uh, I need to ungroup it because uh, I grouped before um, and I'm going to do some like slight uh, data wrangling to get it into shape to um, to plot. So I'm going to um, create, to make sure that the country variable is um, a factor. And then I am going to re um, order the levels of that factor uh, to be in the order of the deaths per year. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to pass it into ggplot. And I want my aesthetics to be x equals country. And I want y to be deaths per year, and g uh, colon, so it's going to be a bar plot with uh, flipped coordinates so that it's easier to read the names of the countries, um, and I think I will stop there. Why are you complaining? Unexpected end of document. Is it? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, so this is a plot. Uh, yay. <laughs> uh, so let's see how it looks like um, when we knit our document. We can see that um, it is included uh, over here. Um, what I wanted to show, which is quite handy when it comes to figures, is that you can use the space over here to add various options um, to basically determine what you want people to see um, in, the, uh, in the document that you create at the end. So for example, um, you may not always want to show the code that you are writing here or uh, the outputs that you're creating here. Um, you know, maybe this is, you know, a report for a supervisor or whatever that doesn't necessarily care what kind of code you wrote uh, to 
create, you know, this, uh, these results, they just want to see, you know, the, the tables and the plots and stuff like that. So they don't want to see the code. So an easy way to get rid of the code is to add this uh, option called echo and to set it to false. By default, um, echo is true and echo means, you know, echo um, the code here uh, into the output document. So if you set it into false, then the code will no longer be shown, right? So now that has gone away. Uh, you can also use those options uh, to edit, uh, to, um, um, to change things about how your plots look. The most common thing that I do there um, is you know, make changes in the dimensions of my plots. So you can do that by fig, um, or you can do fig dim, or you can change. So with fig dim, you can change both the width and um, the height of your plot. Uh, with fig height, obviously, you just change uh, the height. Um, and with fig um, width, you just change the width. Uh, by default, these are in uh, inches, I think. And you can also um, specify them as um, a percentage. So you can say, oh, this is, this is a little bit too big for my report. It's taking up too much space. I want it to be um, a bit smaller. You can just say, oh, I want it to be 80% of what uh, it currently is. And of course, uh, it throws an error, non-numeric argument. Okay, fine. Um, well, you can definitely change it based on inches. I'm, I'm very sure that you can also change it based on percentages. Um, oh, Okay, well, um, sorry about that. Um, I'd have to do some internet search uh, to show exactly how to write it, but it is definitely possible. Uh, I won't look it up right now, but I just wanted to tell you this is something you can do. Um, there's also uh, an option to decide how you want to align your um, plot. Do you want it to be left aligned, right aligned, or center aligned? Um, so let's say I want it to be center aligned. Um, so now it's more to the center than it was before. And something that's really important is um, that you can also give uh, captions uh, to your text. Um, um, total that's in selected countries in 2020. And which is uh, nice <laughs> to be able to show that. Um, and I think that this is also what you use to create old text, uh, alternative text for your figures um, in our markdown. You can also choose for these captions to not be shown, but they are still created um, and will be uh, displayed for any screen readers um, that people are using to, you know, go through your um, HTML usually report online. Um, so these are some options that are specific to plots, which I often find quite helpful. Um, I'd also like you to have a look at, um, oh, this is a visualization about using here as opposed to um, um, absolute paths um, to read in and read out files. Um, so these are some um, options that you can use to customize your chunk output. So I already mentioned um, echo, um, but there are a lot more. Um, so I just wanted you to uh, play around with the different options um, in whichever code chunk uh, you would like um, and re-knit 
um, your document to see uh, what each option uh, does to the output. So there are three that I would like you to play around with. Um, so eval, echo, and include. So if you could just take about five minutes um, to have a look at how these um, affect you know, the output um, and we'll talk again um, at 4.42, unless you, you know, finish before that, which is also fine. <laughs>
All right, uh, it's been about five minutes. So could you give me uh, a thumbs up uh, in the reactions uh, if that was okay, if you were able to more or less figure out what these options are doing in the chunk output. Nice, cool. Um, yeah, so let's have uh, a look as well. So by default, this is echo equals true. Let's look at val equals uh, false uh, and see what that does. Um, so we can see that now there is no output uh, shown. Uh, basically, that's because um, R didn't run this code. <laughs> uh, we told it to not evaluate uh, the code at all. And include equals false. Um, just does not include the whole thing, uh, code or output. Um, there are a lot of different uh, options uh, for chunks um, and it takes a bit of playing around with them to get used uh, to what they actually do. Uh, and I highly encourage you to go and have a look uh, at the cheat sheet uh, for R Markdown and for the chunks um, to get a better understanding of what all the various options are. Um, Something else that I wanted to show you was how to use templates to um, write articles in R Markdown. So as you have seen <laughs> up until now, we've mostly been um, knitting our documents into HTML documents, which is not really going to work if you want to submit uh, a paper to a journal. A lot of the time you want those to be uh, PDFs, but to knit a document to PDF uh, in R Markdown, you need to have a LaTeX distribution. <laughs> um, we're not going to get into what this is, uh, but basically there's an easy way to do this, uh, to be able to knit um, documents from R Markdown to PDF. And what you need to do is first of all, um, install um, tiny tech, install packages, tiny tech, um, which should be fairly fast. Um, and after you have done that, um, then you need to load tiny tech, which is a little bit, anyway, load tiny tech. And after that, uh, use the package to actually install this distribution on your computer by saying, well, I guess you actually, it doesn't matter. Um, by telling your computer, okay, go into the package tiny tech, find the function, install tiny tech and um, do it. I'm actually not going to run this right now because I don't remember how long it takes. Um, and I just want to show you, um, um, what things look uh, when you're actually using a template. So I'm not going to do this, but I highly encourage you to do this um, as I'm speaking uh, and tell me if any problems uh, come up um, with it. But um, I'll go ahead and say that the next thing that you would need to do is install the package uh, articles. So again, install uh, packages articles, which again, should be fairly quick. And what that does is it gives you access to a bunch of templates for um, various journals to create your papers. So the way you use those templates is if you go to, and um, I'll just take a pause here and say, uh, have you tried installing tiny tech with that command? And is that going okay? Should I take a moment because you're like, you know, frantically looking at your computer trying to debug something? Um, or can I show you how to do this? So yeah, just give me a thumbs up, thumbs down uh, in the reactions. Um, 
I see the thumbs up. I see the thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. So the way you do this is you go over here to um, create a new uh, document. So you select our markdown. And before we just created a document and we did this. You can see over here though, um, that you have various options. So you could create a presentation uh, like the one I have um, and you have different options and what kind of file you want to create. You can create a Shiny app, which is that interactive um, app that I was talking about, or you can create something from a template. And because I have a bunch of um, packages installed on my computer. I probably have more templates um, available than you do, but you should have the articles templates and the R markdown templates. Um, so you can see that there are various options, you know, like, um, yeah, uh, you can go, you know, fancy and try something for PNAS or, um, you know, more, um, traditional publishers like Taylor and Francis for uh, preprints, um, PRJ, <laughs> which I know Vicky used to work for. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to show you um, this one, which is uh, for the Journal of Open Source Software, because it has a very nice um, explanation <laughs> within it about how things work, and it has like a lot of text in it. Um, so you'll see that this says this template contains multiple files. Uh, so please create a new directory for these files. And here you have to give your new directory name, which would probably be, you know, like your project name or something like that. Uh, here, I'm just going to say test article and uh, I will put it in my documents folder and uh, I will click okay. And that will open an R markdown document uh, as a new tab uh, over here. And you can see all the various, you can see it's, you know, a, a longish um, template already. And I'm just gonna knit it so you can see um, what that looks like without any edits. So it creates, um, you know, this um, article that looks, uh, if you've ever looked at anything at the Journal of Open Source Software, this is basically what they look like. Um, and it gives you some examples of how to write, you know, equations, um, plots, um, references, because obviously uh, if you're writing an academic paper, you'll need to be, um, you know, referencing other people's work. So you can see some kind of like worked examples basically of um, how you do that. Uh, and this is basically how you do that. Um, you create um, uh, a file, uh, a bib file um, that you use for the bibliography. It's, you know, typeset in a specific way. Uh, and once um, R Markdown can access that, you use this add symbol um, to cite uh, other people. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to show you that this is very possible um, and you know a really handy a really handy way to create um, reproducible um, papers. So yeah, I, I'd encourage you to play around with that and see um, you know if that works for the work that you're doing or um, you know, if you have any questions about, you know, you'd have to play around with it first a bit and see, you know, what uh, doesn't really work for the things that you would like to do. Um, and I'd love to to hear your questions about stuff like that. Um, and we can try to uh, answer them together because I would really like to support uh, people if they wanted to use something like this to write papers because I think it's I think it's really cool. Um, okay. So we have about 10 minutes. So yeah, I just wanted to show you that this is how you can like go and play around with templates for various, from various publishers um, and um, just see if you could um, use that in your work. Uh, also, this is the folder that um, I created uh, when that template told me, okay, there's going to be multiple files here. And this is that bib file that I mentioned. Um, 
somehow I don't have a normal text editor uh, set up. My default is Atom. But anyway, this is what a bib file looks like um, in case you've never uh, encountered these before, which is extremely likely. Um, but the good news is you don't really have to learn how to create these things yourselves. If you're using a reference manager like EndNote or as an as a tarot or Mendeley, um, you can basically just generate these files from your reference managers. You don't have to like sit down and write this by yourself or anything. Uh, you can just export those files um, fairly easily. So in case that was like a scary thing, you're like, ooh, what is this bib file? Um, it's, it's fairly straightforward to create. All right. So with that, um, I just wanted to mention that um, perhaps a little bit upsettingly, uh, now that I've spent two hours telling you about how great our markdown is, um, our markdown is kind of on the way out. Uh, not quite, not yet. Um, but basically the next generation of R Markdown, of literate programming for, um, at least from R Studio, um, is here and it is called Quarto. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how these things differ. Basically, if you already use R Markdown or you're learning to use R Markdown, the jump to Quarto is extremely easy. And when I say extremely easy, um, I don't know if I can show you on this computer because I don't remember if Quarto is installed, but I think basically if you just rename this file to, uh, where is it, scripts. Um, to QMD, which is Quarto Markdown, Markdown instead of R Markdown. And then um, open it. Oh, no, that's the word for it, sorry. Um, I think it basically just works. Yeah, so this is now a Quarto document instead of an R Markdown document. So it's a very easy transition is what I'm saying. So don't worry that you're like, oh, but I started learning this. Now I have to learn this. Um, they are extremely, extremely compatible. It is a very, very easy jump. The great thing about Quarto is that its focus is on encouraging people who use other languages like um, Python or Julia um, to start using this kind of um, you know, um, reproducible document as well. People that primarily use Python uh, have been using uh, mostly um, Jupyter notebooks, which are great. Um, the only thing that I think you can't do with a Jupyter notebook as easily is write a paper, um, like I just show you how to do uh, in R Markdown. So yeah, Quarto is basically the next generation of R Markdown that is not so explicitly um, tied to R as something called R Markdown. Um, it still allows you to create, you know, HTML files, PDF uh, files, Word documents, and all of those other things that I mentioned that you can do with R Markdown. So yeah, if you hear of Quarto, this is what that is. Um, and it is a really cool thing. Uh, you can create some really, really snazzy presentations with it. So I actually really want to play around with it. Um, and with that, um, we've come to the end. So thank you so much for your attention and your participation throughout this workshop series. It's been quite a lot of material. Um, and thank you so much for, you know, bearing with me and being so engaged. Um, it's been really, really lovely, um, teaching this and I hope it has been useful and you're more likely to use R in the future now. Um, and with that, I will stop recording.